So I go to study a lot, um, but I feel that if you're passionate about the field that you want to go into, that you're willing to put in that work. I think we both were definitely willing to put in that work. So, um, but the, all the professors are great. They're able to help you, um, and uh, the student body as well. We all helped each other out. So, um, even though it was hard, it was um, definitely rewarding afterwards. Yeah, like she said, uh, it was a lot at first to take on. Ryan said 25 credit hours. Um, a normal full-time semester at Finley is 18 credit hours. So it kind of goes above and beyond. But also it's, um, like Mackenzie said again, um, the students are there for you, your professors are there for you, your advisor is there for you, and generally they're a professor in the Nuke Med program. So you can always go to anybody around here for help. And if I could follow that up, um, when you're in class, it, it is going to be quite challenging. And I don't know if, if perhaps students out there uh, have talked to some other people who have gone through the program or heard about it, uh, but it is very rigorous, it's very intense. The 25 credit hours that you get basically equates to being in class uh, for seven hours a day, uh, eight to 12, Monday through Thursday, and then two to five in the afternoon, uh, as well as nine to 12, typically on Fridays. Uh, sometimes Fridays we have lab instead of class, sometimes Fridays you have the day off, but it's roughly 28 to 32 hours a week. And then there's going to be about three to four hours, I would say on average, would you say that's about right, mm -hmm. um, of studying in the evening, and there's lots of tests. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> lots of tests. <laughs> but it's, it's one of those things that, um, it's definitely manageable. You don't necessarily have to be a straight A student to do well in the program. Um, I tell students on day one, the key to success in the program is being organized. Mm -hmm. Make sure you have a separate folder, a separate notebook, binder, whatever, for each of the classes that are part of this program. The last thing you want to do is shove everything in one notebook because you won't know which end is up. Um, as long as you stay organized and as long as you come to class every day, take good notes, ask questions, we're here to help. Uh, we'll do everything we can to make sure you get through it. Um, I, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm program director, but I also am a graduate of this very program. Um, I came through the program in 2000. I graduated in 2001. So I sat where these guys have been, um, where our current students are. I've been through it. So I know it from both sides what it's like. And it's challenging, but it's definitely worth it in the end. Awesome. So you touched a little bit on uh, you know, what it takes to get into the program and be in the program. Uh, are you able to shadow? at this point in a, in a high school career or maybe even in your first couple of years at, as a college student, are you able to actually get in and, and, and shadow an actual nuclear, med nuclear medicine technician? Um, Technologist. Sure Technologist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Technologist, yes. Yeah, um, they, they absolutely can and we encourage that because a lot of times when you're a high school student um, or you're early in your college career, you know, we get a lot of undecideds and students who, you know, they tell us, I, I'd like to do something in the medical profession, I'm just not quite sure what. So I certainly encourage students to do some job shadowing. Uh, call up somebody that you know or call the local hospital and talk to somebody in the nuclear medicine department, hey, can I come observe you, observe you for a couple hours today and see what you do. Um, and then do the same thing with some other areas that you might be interested in uh, within the health profession. And you know, we definitely want to have you as nuclear medicine students, but we also understand that we want you to be here for the right reasons. We want you to be here because you want to be here. And the only way that you're really going to know that is if you, in fact, do some of this job shadowing. Um, and it is one of the things that is a requirement, as in uh, one of our entrance requirements, is that you do have to do a minimum of eight hours observation. Um, and that's usually following the application process but we certainly encourage it before that as well. Can I follow that up with something? Um, yes, please. Uh, I had no idea what nuclear medicine was before I started the program. I had no clue. I didn't know what I was getting myself into at all, basically. <laughs> um, so that shadowing is a really good idea. I didn't do it because I, I don't know why, 
but it's a really good idea to figure out what you actually want to do, see what the ins and outs kind of of nuclear medicine before you say, that's what I'm doing. Getting hands on before you actually get the hands on. Right. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> so the nuclear medicine program is here on campus. We also have a pet CT program that is here on campus as well. And you guys can actually speak to that directly because you've moved out of the nuclear medicine program. You've earned your certificates and now you are pet CT students. Talk to me about that a little bit. Uh, well, the pet CT in order to be eligible for that, you have to be nuclear medicine certified, whether that's through um, the NMTCB or the ARRT, which are two certification companies. Um, but after you get through that, you can apply for the pet CT program and it's all online. Um, the, uh, sorry, the semester before, from at least in our case, from August to December, we'll do um, online classwork. And then from December till August again is when we'll do all our um, clinical work, so. So yeah, it's kind of set up like the nuclear medicine program as far as coursework for a semester and then clinicals for two semesters. Um, but that coursework being online, you can have a job either in the nuclear medicine um, department or you can have, like I have an on-campus job, um, part-time job, uh, Whatever you need to do, you can do, and then time for your homework is the most important, obviously, but it, it does give you a chance to have a job outside of the class. So why did you guys move from the nuclear medicine program? You had your certificate. Mm -hmm. Why'd you move into the PET CT program? What advantages are there? Um, definitely hiring. Um, PET CT is expanding pretty rapidly now, and if you have that dual, certif dual certification in both NUCMED and the PET CT, it makes you a lot better um, applicant for being hired, and also just gives you a more roundabout idea of what goes on, um, both the similarities and differences between those two programs. So. Yeah, like she said, um, employability is number one why I decided to go with PET CT but also um, during your nuclear medicine clinicals you have a two-week rotation of PET and you can kind of see what goes on in a PET CT department and then that way you can decide from there whether do you want to be in PET CT do you want to just go nuclear medicine and I decided with that two-week rotation that hey this is really cool this is something I want to do so and again, uh, to kind of explain a little bit about what PET-CT is, um, PET is positron emission tomography, which is basically just a fancy way of saying it's nuclear medicine, but at a little bit higher level. Um, and in addition to that, CT is CAT scan, which I mentioned before is another um, department within radiology. And all of those departments re require their own education and board certification. So the way we've established this program is we have nuclear medicine graduates. They've completed the program. They are board certified now in nuclear medicine. Then they applied to our PET CT program for one additional year of education. You walk out of here with a dual major, a uh, bachelor's degree dual major. And in addition to that, you can become, we are already board certified in nuclear medicine and you'll be eligible for board certification in PET as well as board certification in CT, CAT scan. So that's three imaging modalities that will make you much more marketable uh, for the workplace. And you can get all that in five years. <laughs> <laughs> so more bang for your buck, right? That's my, that actually my next question, is how many years has, has it taken thus far and will take until you mm -hmm. guys walk out of here and with all of the fancy awesome letters behind your name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for me, I'm, I'm doing the bachelor's degree, so I'm here for five years so mm -hmm. far. This will be my fifth year, and then I'll be done. <laughs> it's the same with me, so. <laughs> That's awesome. So real quick, once again, if anyone out there would like to ask any questions, there's a little chat box below the video that you're viewing, and uh, we will answer those on the spot. Um, otherwise, you can go out to Twitter, and you can Use at you Finley, ask your question, and then make sure you use the hashtag AskUF. So starting out in the nuclear medicine program, let's let's back up a little bit. Remember the first day you came in, you sat down, 
what <laughs> what is going through your mind as far as what what did you guys expect moving moving into this program? The first day is the day um, in undergrad when you go through college normally. Well, not normally, but the first few years of college, people call the first week of college syllabus week. That's the week that you <laughs> basically do nothing all week. Your teachers go through the syllabus with, syllabus with you. That was the first day with us. Then the next day, we were learning. <laughs> like we went right into learning. Um, the first day they told us all about how hard it was going to be and how stressful and we were kind of losing our minds I think. <laughs> and then after that um, once you get into it then you're just like okay calm down. <laughs> yeah the first day um, first and foremost you got to pick your favorite seat. Um, <laughs> you're undefined to find yeah. um, But after that, like Megan said, you basically have one day of syllabus work and then you get right into it. And um, although we get right into it, it's, um, we, I don't know, we make it part of our life just to mm -hmm. study all the time. So it really wasn't too bad to get into a process of studying every day. So although it was rough, it was still exciting too. Good deal. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no? I'm just saying okay. it was very exciting. <laughs> okay, no problem. Well, let's <clears throat> let's talk about the the hands-on portion of this program, and 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 what it is. Now, we have an arm <laughs> sitting we have an arm. sitting very comfortably in front of you. <laughs> to tell me what's going on here. So this is this is the practice arm that we use. Um, in our labs that Ryan said something about. We do labs once in a while in class. Um, so these are the venipuncture arms that we practice with. So when we actually um, dose our patients with the radioactivity, we do it through IV. So we put a needle in their arm, <laughs> essentially, and, and we inject the radioactivity straight into their veins. So, you, you guys like that? to? Would you like to demonstrate it a little bit? <laughs> oh, sure. So starting out in the hands-on, we're always going to put gloves on, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. We like to make it as um, lifelike as possible. Mm -hmm. Even though we're using fake arms, um, it always helps just to start in that practice of putting gloves on. So um, it kind of makes it easier when you move into to your clinical work that we already know that first things first is to put our gloves on and alcohol the patient. So it makes it a lot better. <laughs> So, yeah, we were always taught to always um, first palpate the arm. Um, we go, we have a lab where we basically get a partner and palpate each other's veins, so it's pretty exciting. Um, and then we go to our fake arms and we um, kind of find where we feel like there is a vein. Um, and even though they're fake, you can still feel, so it's pretty nice. Um, so we just alcohol. And how she said we can still feel the veins. These arms aren't really like a, a real <laughs> arm, <laughs> but it does give you the practice for actual technique and, and getting the the um, needle into the vein. Um, do you want to turn it or no? Oh, yeah, I guess we can do that. <laughs> um, also, uh, with a real arm, the veins aren't going to pop pop right up for you. Um, so what we do is we tie a tourniquet around the patient's arm and that'll help the veins pop up with that pressure added onto it. So she tourniqueted, tourniqueted? I don't know if that's a word. <laughs> yes it is. <laughs> she alcohol swabbed the arm. She stuck it. Oh. And then and there's, now. There's the blood. <laughs> there, that is the blood. Then you take the tourniquet off so that the patient doesn't bleed everywhere. And then there's your blood. So there you go. <laughs> Excellent. How how often do you guys get into this lab and, and do this? Um practicing with the um, fake arms. We didn't do it quite often because of the fact that it really isn't like a real arm. Um, the, 
it's really not. <laughs> the main focus why we did the fake arms is just to try to get the technique, like I said before, the feel of actually trying to find a vein in the arm, and then the technique of the angle of the of the needle and just mm -hmm. the alcohol swabbing tourniquet, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. And just really the procedure too, like putting mm -hmm. your tourniquet on and wiping it with alcohol, just the whole procedure, it helps to you know, start that, even though it's a little bit different in the clinical setting, it's still nice to start out having to know something about it so you're not as nervous. Mm -hmm. We set this up as one of our labs on Fridays, uh, so students get practice during the lab itself. And then, you know, if students ask, you know, can I get a little bit more practice on these arms before mm -hmm. going off to clinicals, you know, certainly we'll allow that. Uh, the real practice, though, <laughs> is when they're actually in clinicals. Because they're working on real life patients then. And uh, they learn quickly yeah. uh, the <laughs> arts of venipuncture. Yeah, yeah. because so it's, it's definitely one of my favorite parts too. It is. <laughs> it's my favorite part. When I was first starting, though, I left. I want to say this big of a bruise on somebody <laughs> on on one of my techs that let me practice on him. I left this big of a bruise, and that was my first venipuncture. So, you know, <laughs> it's hard at first, but you'll get you'll get the technique. But you'll never forget the first time. Absolutely. Right. That's right. Yeah, that's it's right. definitely a skill that, as a technologist, you have to become very proficient in, mm -hmm. in, in right away. Because, again, our cameras don't produce any radiation like, say, an X-ray camera would. We have to administer the radiation so that the camera can see it. So that's why venipuncture is so important, because that's how we actually administer the, mm -hmm. the drugs to make the patient the radioactive source. So every, every exam we do requires administration of a, of a drug. Excellent, excellent. We have another student joining us. Hello. <laughs> so please please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Kyra Kadri. And you are a current NMI student? Yes, sir, I am. Okay. You're not in the PET CT program? Um, no, okay. I'm not. <laughs> so not yet. Not yet. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good deal. All right. So another Another hands-on that we have, another little demonstration we have for you. Um, <clears throat> we'll move the arm here real quick. And we'll go a little, a little bit different on this, on this side of things. So there's a rock. There's a rock. <laughs> and there is some kind of a meter, almost mm -hmm. like, looking like it came out of the Ghostbusters movie. <laughs> so yeah, that's where we got it. Tell me. <laughs> it <was a> donation <laughs> from Ghostbusters. <laughs> tell me about this. What What is this instrument? How do you guys use it? Well, I'll explain it briefly, and then I'll allow Kyra to demonstrate. Um, but basically, as I said, since we're working with liquid radioactivity via IV administration, um, the fact that it's liquid is 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 a concern because it can easily drip out of our needle syringe uh, system and can get in our work area. So the problem with that then is anything that this radioactivity comes in contact with, it has now contaminated uh, these areas. So from a working perspective, there's no way for us to actually see this because uh, this radioactivity is just like saline. It's, it's clear, like water. So it doesn't glow. We don't know it's there unless we see a little droplet laying there. So it's very easy for us to mistakenly or accidentally get this on our hands. And then now it's on our hands. We go out into the waiting room to get our next patient. And what's the first thing that we do? We introduce ourselves. We shake our hand with the patient. So now I've spread that from my hand to the patient's hand. Well, the patient throughout the day is going to be walking around touching things. So the patient might walk up the stairs or down the stairs touching the handrail. And so now they're spreading that liquid contamination that's gone from their hand to the handrail or touch the elevator button. So another person that's walking in the hallway could come in contact with that, touch it, spread it elsewhere, and then it takes off going in various directions. So you can see how this radioactivity can become um, can start to spread throughout the facility, and it's our job to keep it contained, to find out if there are any contaminated locations, and if there are, we have to clean it up. 
So that's where this machine comes into play. Uh, this is a Geiger Mueller detector, or commonly referred to as a GM survey meter. And if you've watched some of the CSI shows or anything dealing with, you know, uh, radio hazard type spills, radioactive type spills, you've probably seen these devices. And when you turn it on, it will sense, it will detect where the radioactivity is. And we survey our areas, we survey different areas throughout the department, and at the end of the day, and usually at the beginning of the day, to see if we've contaminated anything, and then we have to clean it up. The way this responds is through a loud chirping sound, okay? So if I were to turn this on, then you'll periodically hear some of these chirps. That chirping that you hear right now is what we call background radiation, and that's the naturally occurring radioactivity that's all around us that comes from the rocks and the ground, uh, comes from the stars in the sky, and it's everywhere. Okay, there's nothing we can do about it. So we expect to get this, but when we come in contact with something that's truly radioactive, it will respond quite differently. And in fact, yes. you want to demonstrate that for us. So the closer we get to something that's radioactive, or we like to say hot, it will make this annoying chirping sound. <laughs> and the more uh, radioactive or hotter the source, the more um, intense the sound. So basically, as Ryan explained, as nuclear medicine technologists, we just go around basically surveying the areas after we're done or if there is a contamination or leak in the department just to make sure that the levels of radio, uh, radioactivity are not um, ridiculously high. Um, although we do use relatively low um, levels of radioactivity in, um, in nuclear medicine, um, it's better, no radioactivity is better than little radioactivity. So we just try to make sure that we get um, as little radioactivity as possible and no contamination. And, no contamination. <laughs> and that's the most important part. Yeah. Yeah. So would you use this every day? Let's say, let's say as, um, actually, let's turn that off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Um, if, if you're working in a lab every day, would you use that every day to make sure that your lab is clean at the beginning? You mentioned the beginning of the day, the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a clean sweep. So it's a clean space all the time. Yes. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, we call them um, daily surveys. We'll go around and um, basically your hospital or wherever you're working is going to have like a map of the department and you'll go around and survey the injection chair and the injection desk and then you'll go around to maybe if you're in a cardiac center um you go around to the treadmills and see if there's a drip where you were injecting somebody during a stress test so we'll go around and make sure that there's no contamination and record all that stuff one of the other things that we commonly use the gm detector for is um most hospitals will get their radioactive drugs, the radio pharmaceuticals, from a radio pharmacy. It's a pharmacy that specializes in radioactive drugs, essentially. And they will then ship these drugs to their clients, uh, nuclear medicine departments. And those will be the drugs that we inject the patients with. Well, these drugs, they come in cases. They're in vials, um, and they're, they're in these cases that have some lead shielding. Um, but again, since it's liquid, there's always the possibility that there could be some leakage. And so we have to make sure that when they arrive in our department, that there's no external contamination on these cases, because if there is, and we touch them, then we have what I just explained a few minutes ago. Um, likewise, then at the end of the day, before we send them back to the radio pharmacy that they came from, we don't want to contaminate the truck. Uh, we don't want to contaminate the person who's transporting this stuff. So we have to make sure that the case is is clean as well before it gets sent back. And we'll use this for that. Excellent. Excellent. Another reminder, you can ask all of your questions uh, underneath the video you're viewing right there in the little chat box. Or you can go out to Twitter and you can use at you Finley, ask your question, and then add the hashtag AskUF. Excellent. Um, these are really good hands-on everything. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's perfect for the field. It's ideal in the workspace. Excellent. So 
let's move on to some questions. Uh, typical questions that students usually ask coming into the program. We'll start out plain and simple. I, I want to do nuclear medicine and I got to play a sport. Am I able, am I able to do both? Would you like me to answer that one? Probably <laughs> better. Okay, please. Well, um, sort of. <laughs> um, as a student athlete, uh, certainly your first three years uh, during your undergraduate studies, absolutely, you can play sports. Um, that becomes a little bit of a scheduling problem uh, during the professional phase, your final year, when you're here at the Nuclear Medicine Institute. Um, we have two classes, or we start two classes every year. We have a fall class, and then we start a second class in the spring. The reason I say that is, say, for example, you're a football player. Football, of course, is a fall sport. So if you are not scheduled to start the NMI program until spring of your senior year, then playing football in the fall of your senior year will not be an issue at all. Um, however, if you are a fall student playing a fall sport, uh, because we have classes that run essentially seven hours a day um, that are typically through the uh, sports practice times and so forth, uh, it can be quite challenging. So we strongly encourage students, uh, if they want to play a fall sport um, or sports in general, that um, well, a fall sport that they probably reserve or wait until starting the NMI program in the spring, um, or else it's, you're just pulled in too many different directions. OK. So as a, as a high school student, you know, I, I enjoy science. I like these sciences, but that might not be enough. So what, what advice you, would you have for a high school student that is interested in this program? Uh, like we talked about before, um, uh, shadowing. You could do that to uh, get a little bit of experience, um, see what, what nuclear medicine is. Um, taking science classes in high school is always a good thing. Uh, knowing your anatomy, that's really important here in Nuke Med, especially if you're doing like the short track associate's degree. You might not get all that experience um, in, in the college level that you need. Yeah, like Megan said, especially um, your bios and anatomies, um, anatomy especially, just because when we're looking at the screen on an image we just took, we want to make sure that we know is this normal or not normal, depending on like um, the regular bio writing of the radiopharmaceutical that we use. We want to make sure that we know what we're looking at, um, especially if um, our patients have questions, we want to be able to um, knowingly tell them what things are, what things aren't, especially to ease their minds. So. It definitely is a plus. And good study habits, too. <laughs> <laughs> Always important. Yes. <laughs> also, uh, research is pretty important, too. Um, I remember when I first came in, uh, I'm not from Ohio, so I didn't know anything about nuclear medicine. And I'm pretty sure uh, nuclear medicine is really big in this area in the Midwest. So coming from Texas, um, I had no idea what it was. I just knew that there was a certain path that I wanted to go on in the healthcare field. and nuclear medicine would help me get there. So after I applied and got accepted, um, I did more research. And I know I kind of did things backwards, but um, I, I applied, I did research, and I actually started to like what I was seeing. And I thought it was really interesting how we used radioactivity you know, to, um, to bring up images. And after doing my research, which the internet can be good for things. <laughs> so after doing my research, um, it, it kind of convinced me, as well as shadowing once I did get here. Um, and it kind of solidified my decision in um, you know, applying to the program and actually going through with the program. So it, I would just say it, it depends on what you're looking for. I personally wasn't the conventional kind of student where I knew that I wanted to do nuclear medicine. I had, like a, I had a plan, which I wanted to, uh, I was a pre-med student. And I wanted to major in something that would allow me to work in case med medical school did not go through, which it did not. I decided to, you know, stay with nuclear medicine, and I'm so happy I made that decision. So if there's any of you guys out there who, you know, need something that you can work with that still puts you in the um, the medical field, and if you still want to do, you know, medicine and go on to medical school, 
especially here at the University of Finley, you can accomplish a lot of your prerequisites uh, with the nuclear medicine program. So it's kind of like a, a two in one kind of thing. So yeah. yeah. Excellent. A couple more questions here. Um, <clears throat> Are you guys currently involved in any student organizations on campus? Yeah, I'm actually um, the treasurer for Habitat for Humanity, so um, I do a lot of volunteer work for them, so I'm involved a lot with them, and then a little bit with campus ministries. So it's definitely, um, you're able to do both, which I really appreciate. Uh, like I said before, I'm, I'm not involved in any uh, organizations myself, but I do have an on-campus job that kind of helps me meet a lot of people. Um, it's it's kind of hard to keep that job uh, with all of the credits. I mean, I did have the same job while I was in nuclear medicine. It just depends on the flexible hours. If you can find a job with flexible hours and you can do the coursework still, go for it. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, meeting new people is really important in college and that job helped me a lot with that. And I'm a member of the African Student Association here at Finley, as well as the Black Student Association. If you can handle um, work or um, a, some kind of organization or something, I think it's it's good because it helps you take away from the fact that you're in the program. Sometimes it can be really um, demanding, and that just goes to say, you know, anything worth achieving is going to be hard. So, like Ryan said earlier, you know, we're in class basically seven hours of the day. So. Sometimes it's good to be able to meet with people on campus once a week or once every two weeks or something and just, you know, be a student and be on campus. So don't think that, you know, because you're part of the nuclear medicine program that you have to close everyone out and isolate yourself and, you know, this isn't med school yet. If, if you're thinking about it, it's not exactly med school. And even med students, you know, they, they're they pretty um, social. So uh, don't think that you, don't ha you, you can't be social while being a nuclear medicine student. Mm -hmm. I guess that's what I'm saying. Yeah, and I would, I would support everything that they've said as well, because we want the college experience to be the full college experience, you know, and um, even though it is going to be more challenging during that final year, if you have a passion to be part of an organization, uh, we certainly want the students to do that as long as they can balance, you know, their time and, and so forth. Uh, we have a student, uh, another student who, who's not part of this group here tonight, that's currently in the nuclear medicine uh, program. And he is the um, he is the head of the healthcare organization uh, student club uh, that discusses various um, various things that you could potentially do within the larger healthcare um, profession uh, to give other groups of students who aren't quite sure what they want to do some ideas and so forth. Um, and we've had him uh, had several meetings here in this building. Uh, after hours, but yeah, there's lots of opportunities and we encourage that. Outstanding. It's it's refreshing to see that you guys can step away from the program for a little bit and then focus on something else, decompress, come back, and really put your put all your effort into it. So excellent. Excellent. Um, one of the last questions that I have here is is just simply where where are you guys going with this degree? Where do you see it taking you and maybe what what that dream job might be? Um, well, at least for me, um, since I am new command certified and I'm going to be PET and CT certified, um, I'd like to use those. Um, I'm applying right now to be a physician assistant. I'm here at the university actually. Um, so I plan to allow these imaging modalities to help me be a well-rounded um, healthcare physician assistant. Um, so having these backgrounds, I think, gives me an edge up um, when dealing with my patients, um, just because I'm going to know a little bit more about nuke med, whereas maybe another PA or another physician would not. So I feel like that just makes me more well-rounded. Gives so. you the edge. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, for me, I plan to start out as a technologist in a hospital or, a, or in a cardiologist's um, office. Maybe, uh, maybe a pet CT technologist. It's kind of wide open for me right now. Um, maybe eventually become a head of a department, uh, get into sales. It's really wide open as far as the field of nuclear medicine. And for me, um, I'm looking into probably going to get my master's and then hopefully eventually my PhD. Um, I'm still kind of weighing my options. I'm thinking I've been really interested in medical physics lately and um, 
with that, they deal with basically like the direct um, treatment of cancer with people. So they come up with treatment plans and, and they go into kind of like the physics and the imaging also a part of it. So I think the nuclear medicine part really helps me with that. Um, I mean, the, the options are endless. You can go into administration, you can go to med school and become a physician, a nuclear medicine physician if you'd like. So for me, it's just about um, figuring out what I'm good at and also what's feasible. Um, part of the reason why I decided not to go to medical school was the fact I just didn't want to do it. I just, <laughs> <laughs> to be quite honest, I just did, I was so tired of, of science. I love science, but I was tired and I didn't think I can put it, you know, that much further. So um, for me, it's kind of, you know, weighing out my options and seeing what uh, fits with me. So the good thing about it is I have time and I have the clinical portion, which I can go and, you know, get to see what the hospital's like and what these different um, jobs entail. So, yeah. Great. So as our, as our three students had said, uh, and as you can probably see, there are quite a few different opportunities. Um, the majority of our graduates do work as nuclear medicine technologists in the hospital setting, uh, but Megan had alluded to possibly working for a cardiologist. Um, Mackenzie had said uh, going to PA school. We have graduates who have gone on to PA school. Uh, Kyra had said, you know, healthcare physics, medical physics. Uh, we've had graduates that have done that. We've had graduates that have gone on to medical school. We've had graduates that have gone on to dental school. <laughs> Um, and a whole lot of other options. But as a technologist, you can work in the hospital, you can work in the clinic, you can work in outpatient facilities, you can get into sales, you can get into research, you can get into uh, service repair when the machines go down, there's somebody that needs to come and fix those. You can get into applications because the studies that we do require computer processing to make the images look really pretty for the doctors to read. So there's gotta be people that do those application type jobs. Uh, there's there's just a number of things, education with experience and so forth, just a number of things that you could ultimately get into. Great, so wrapping things up, do you guys have any final thoughts that you'd like to throw out there for any incoming incoming <laughs> students at the at the high school level, at you know, anyone who might be viewing this already in the career might want to come back, maybe work on a bachelor's degree? Um. I just want to say, uh, like, with what we were saying before about uh, it being stressful, don't let that scare you, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> because um, it you can do it, basically. You can do it. You can get through it if you uh, work hard and study. Yeah. yeah. I'd say if anybody has any more questions, like, um, even though we might not be able to do it through the Hangout, um, these guys are always, like, available to help us, and I'm sure they'd be able to help you guys, so any more questions, it's not hard to get a hold of somebody. Absolutely, I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody has. Um, you can send me an email, you can call me, you can stop by here. Uh, we can talk face to face, whatever you guys want to do, more than happy to do that. All right, from the Nuclear Medicine Institute that is here on campus at the University of Finley, we're standing here in the lab. We will talk to everybody later. Thanks, yes. guys. Thank you. Bye.